physical courage is something you see on a battlefield. Moral courage you almost never see. And that's why, for me, it is such an honor to be in a room with people who have exhibited moral courage. All resistance must recognize that the body politic and global capitalism are dying. And the economic devastation of global capitalism will soon be matched by ecological devastation. Our imperial state is collapsing from the inside out. We should stop wasting energy trying to reform it or appeal to corporate systems of power. This does not mean the end of resistance, but it does mean very different forms of resistance. It means turning our energies toward building sustainable communities, such as this one, to weather the coming crisis, since we will be unable to survive and resist without a cooperative effort. These communities, if they retreat into a pure survivalist mode without linking themselves to the concentric circles of the wider community, the state and the planet will become as morally and spiritually bankrupt as the corporate forces arrayed against us. All infrastructures we build, like the monasteries in the Middle Ages, should seek to keep alive the rebellious intellectual and artistic traditions that make a civil society, humanism, and the common good possible. Access to parcels of agricultural land will be paramount. We will have to grasp, as the medieval monks did, that we cannot alter the larger culture around us, at least in the short term, but we may be able to retain the moral codes and culture for generations beyond ours. Resistance will be reduced to small, often imperceptible acts of defiance as those who retain their integrity discovered in the long night of 20th century fascism and communism. We stand on the cusp of one of the bleakest periods in human history when the bright lights of a civilization blink out and we descend for decades, if not centuries, into barbarity. The elites have successfully convinced us that we no longer have the capacity to understand the revealed truths presented before us or to fight back against the chaos caused by economic and environmental catastrophe. As long as the mass of bewildered and frightened people fed electronic images that permit them to perpetually hallucinate exist in this state of barbarism, they may periodically strike out with a blind fury against increased state repression, growing poverty, and food shortages, but they will lack the ability and self-confidence to challenge in big and small ways the structures of control. The fantasy of widespread popular revolt and mass movements breaking the hegemony of the corporate state is just that, a fantasy. I am not finally a pacifist. I know there are times, and even concede that this may eventually be one of them, when human beings are forced to respond to mounting repression with violence. When you ingest the poison of violence, even in a just cause, it corrupts, deforms, and perverts you. <laughs> violence is a drug. Indeed, it is the most potent narcotic known to humankind. And those most addicted to violence are those who have an access to weapons and a penchant for force. These killers rise to the surface of any armed movement and contaminate it with the intoxicating and seductive power that comes with the ability to destroy. 
I have seen it in war after war. When you go down that road, you end up pitting your monsters against their monsters. And the sensitive, the humane, the gentle, those who have a propensity to nurture and protect life are marginalized and often killed. We have undergone, as John Ralston Saul writes, a coup d'etat in slow motion. And the coup is over. They won. We lost. The abject failure of liberals to push corporate industrialized states towards serious environmental reform at Copenhagen, to thwart imperial adventurism, or to build a humane policy towards the masses of the world's poor, stems from an inability to recognize the new configuration of power. The paradigm of power has irre irrevocably altered, and so must the paradigm of resistance. Junk politics does not demand justice or the reparation of rights. It always personalizes issues rather than clarifying them. It has skews real debate for manufactured scandals, celebrity gossip, and spectacles. It trumpets eternal optimism, endlessly praises our moral strength and character, and communicates in a feel-your-pain language. The result of junk politics is that nothing changes meaning zero interruption in the processes and practices that strengthen existing interlocking systems of socioeconomic advantage. The new paradigm of power, coupled with its bizarre ideology of limitless progress and impossible happiness, has turned whole nations, including the United States, into monsters. Power is in the hands of moral and intellectual trolls who are ruthlessly creating a system of neo-feudalism and killing the ecosystem that sustains the human species. The rot of imperialism, which is always incompatible with democracy, has seen the military and arms manufacturers monopolize up to a trillion dollars a year in defense-related spending even as the nation faces economic collapse. These corporate forces, extolling the benefits of privatization, have effectively dismantled the institutions of social democracy, social security, unions, welfare, public health services, and public housing, and rolled back the social and political ideals of the New Deal. We are living through one of civilization's great seismic reversals. The ideology of globalization, like all inevitable utopian visions, is a fraud. The power elite, perplexed and confused as the economy collapses, clings to the disastrous principles of globalization and its outdated language to mask the looming political and economic crisis. The absurd idea that the marketplace should dominate economic and political constructs led industrial nations to sacrifice other areas of human importance, from working conditions to taxation to child labor to hunger to health and pollution on the altar of free trade. It left the world's poor worse off, and the United States with the largest deficits, which can never be repaid, in human history. The massive bailouts, stimulus packages, giveaways, and short-term debt, along with imperial wars we can no longer afford, will leave us struggling to finance nearly $5 trillion in debt by the end of this year. This will require Washington to auction off about $96 billion in debt a week. All traditional standards and beliefs are shattered in a severe economic crisis. The moral order is turned upside down. The honest and industrious are wiped out. 
while the gangsters, profiteers, and speculators walk away with millions. The free market's assumption that nature and human beings are objects whose worth is determined by the market allows each to be exploited for profit until exhaustion or collapse. A society that no longer recognizes that nature and human life have a sacred dimension, an intrinsic value beyond monetary value, commits collective suicide. Such societies cannibalize themselves until they die. And that is what we are undergoing. If we build self-contained structures, ones that do as little harm as possible to the environment, perhaps we can weather the coming collapse. This task will be accomplished through the existence of small physical enclaves that have access to sustainable agriculture, are able to sever themselves as much as possible from commercial culture, and can become increasingly self-sufficient. These communities will have to build walls against the electronic propaganda and fear that will be pumped out over the airwaves. Acts of resistance, in the end, are moral acts. They begin because people of conscience understand the moral imperative to challenge systems of abuse and despotism. Acts of resistance should not be carried out because they are effective, but because they are right. Those who begin these acts are always few in number and often dismissed by those who hide their cowardice behind their cynicism. Resistance, however marginal, continues to affirm life in a world awash in death. It is the supreme act of faith, the highest form of spirituality, and alone makes hope possible. Rebellion, however, is not the same as revolution. Revolution works towards the establishment of a new power structure. Rebellion is about perpetual revolt and permanent alienation from power. And it is only in a state of rebellion that we can hold fast to moral imperatives that prevent a descent into tyranny. Rebellion keeps alive this other narrative. It sustains our integrity and it empowers others who we may never meet to stand up and carry the flame we pass to them. No act of resistance is useless, but we will have to resist and then find the faith that resistance is worthwhile, for we will often not immediately alter or affect that awful configuration of power. And in this long, long war, a community to sustain us emotionally and materially will be the key to a life of defiance. Hope endures even in these often imperceptible acts of defiance. This defiance, this capacity to say no, is what the psychopathic forces in control of our power systems are seeking to eradicate. As long as we are willing to defy these forces, we have a chance, if not for ourselves, then at least for those who follow. And as long as we defy these forces, we remain alive. And for now, that may be the only victory possible. Thank you.